So that's that. Now I'm ready to tell you one final word, which is please join the Free Software Foundation. The FSF needs your support. And if you join at fsf.org, we've gone to a lot of work to make sure that you can do that payment without running any non-free JavaScript code. It's important for us to practice what we preach. <clears throat> so please join or donate. But right now it's time for questions. Bring the papers to me and let me read them. Thank you. And so keep seeing people maybe writing more questions now. <clears throat> Your thoughts about Web3. Are cryptographic guarantees sufficient to trust personal information? Doesn't it contradict with free software? Well, <clears throat> there's no contradiction in principle between free software and uh, non-published personal information. First of all, uh, the personal data is normally not software. And uh, in the free software movement, we don't say that every piece of information has to be published. Uh, in general, we're in favor of privacy for our personal information and your personal information. <clears throat> we don't say that even that every program must be released. You are free to write programs and never show them to anybody. We never said you shouldn't. <clears throat> in fact, free licenses Part of being free with Freedom One is that you can make a modification and never publish your modified version or the diff or anything. You're never required to publish any version. What Freedom two, Three says is that you have the freedom to publish your modification or your modified version, but you don't have to. You can get a copy of GNU Emacs and make edits to serve your convenience, and you don't have to publish those. Now, Copyleft says that if you do publish those and others download that or get copies of it, they t also must likewise get the four freedoms but you don't have to give a copy to any particular person. You don't have to ever offer copies to anybody. Freedom 3 doesn't say you must publish your modified version. It only says you are free to do so if you choose. So there is no even hint of conflict between free software and copyleft and privacy for things that are personal. If you write a program for your personal use, by all means, keep it private if, that's you, if that helps you. Now, if it were a, a program of some general usefulness, I, at such that having it would be a help to a lot of people, then I would urge you to make the program more general, make the things that you personally like, be controlled by parameters, which you could specify one way, and I could specify a different way, and then release your program, contribute it to the community. But it's never required that you publish a program or distribute it to anybody at all. So I think that that means there's no actual contradiction or between them. Could you think about blockchain tech can help defend human rights related to free software? <clears throat> I am not sure. Uh, Bruce Schneier 
a few years ago said that in his view, uh, blockchain didn't make possible anything that couldn't be done without it. I'm not an expert and in that field, and I don't know. Uh, because my concern is not about uh, software like that. It's about making sure the software we use is free. So I saw that the various uh, cryptocurrencies people were talking about were implemented with free software, and I said, okay, that's good on that score. It's being handled the right way. And I didn't look at it any further because that's the aspect of things that I focus on. <clears throat> Is bullshit okay if people agree on it with, with a consensus system? I'm not completely sure what a consensus system is. Uh, bullshit may be okay as humor, and uh, dissociated press is fun. So maybe so. The point is that bullshit becomes dangerous when it's presented as truth. So perhaps if every bullshit generator's output was interspersed with lines saying, this is output from a bullshit generator, don't assume anything in it is uh, veridical, then it might be harmless. I'm not sure. Have you heard of the term, quote, fair source, unquote? I don't know. I don't think I have. Uh, and it's the functional source license. I'm not sure what that is. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe you could look in gnu.org slash licenses slash license dash list dot html and see if those licenses are listed there. Uh, if they are, you could maybe tell us what they say, or if they're not, maybe you could email me uh, those licenses so we at the FSF could think about them and uh, judge whether they are free licenses. Can't we just call it free and open software? Well, if that's what you want to say, I can't stop you, but I think it's misleading. Uh, first of all, do you mean uh, the set that includes free programs and open source programs? Or does it mean the programs that are at once both free and open source? You can see one of these is a conjunction, one of them is a disjunction. <clears throat> uh, free, or you could take that as meaning that Free is synonymous with open source, but they are not synonymous. They are very different. I recommend reading gnu.org slash philosophy slash open source misses the point dot html, which explains thoroughly every aspect of the relationship between free software and open source software. How much do you know about Web3? Not a tremendous amount. That's not my field. Have you ever written a smart contract? And if so, and if no, why? Well, first of all, I've never used Ethereum. And as far as I know, that's the only way smart contracts get implemented. I have not had a hunger to do it because the idea makes me worry. Uh, in society, contracts can be dissolved. They can be voided. And this is sometimes a very good thing. For instance, it makes possible bankruptcy. 
it means that if you sign yourself up to a contract that requires you to work for the rest of your life, it can be declared invalid because uh, legally one can't bind oneself for the rest of one's life like that. Uh, I am worried about whether some sort of computerized contracts will eliminate protections of freedom, such as bankruptcy law. I, can, I expect that a lot of businesses would jump at the chance to set up contracts and invite people to sign them, which will trap them forever and they can't get out. Some software is advertised as, quote, open but not open source. Uh, how do you apply the free software definition for AI models? Well, we're thinking about that question right now. <clears throat> so I'm not sure. Uh, basic, it has to be, in principle, the same freedoms. So how do you apply it to some, some kind of computer system where part of, in addition to programs, there are also collections of data <coughs> which were not written by anyone but were <coughs> produced by operation of the system, name, which is what we mean by training. And the result is data that is useful for achieving a certain result when the program operates on it, but was never designed by humans, so there is no source code or anything comparable to it. Well, one way of looking at it is, can you change that data? If it were a program with source code, you could change the source code and so, yes, you could change the thing and how it would behave. Well, for, say, uh, machine learning control data, it would, have, it would need also to give you a way to change it. Well, one possible way is continuing the training, incremental training. You could use that to change how the system would behave. <clears throat> but it's a fact that since, you, since people can't understand the meaning of the, of the data in that collection, there's no way to try to get a precise result. You train uh, one of these recognition systems and later you'll get surprising behavior some of the time. And that may be a general rule. I'm not an expert in that field. But if the most you can ever expect <clears throat> is a sort of approximate correctness, an approximate fit with the specifications you want to achieve, <clears throat> well, maybe it's good enough if incremental training gives you that much. If, it, if it's the most you can ever hope for in that field, it had better be enough or else you don't want to do the thing that way. How to make people care? Uh, you can't, as far as I know, you can't make people feel this or that. <clears throat> People's own minds contribute to what they care about, to the, to the choice of what, they, what to care about, uh, what I find is that <clears throat> it's good to present the issue in ways that relate to things people care about in other areas of life. And in the 14-minute video, you can see where I got to following that approach. Should I have the freedom of distributing, creating, and support proprietary software? <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, I think you shouldn't do those things 
but that doesn't mean you should be prohibited to do them. I tend to think <clears throat> that if there's something people want, prohibiting it is often not a very good solution. Uh, look what happens from prohibiting dangerous drugs. On the other hand, maybe you can figure out why, if you see a lot of people trying to use dangerous drugs, maybe you can see what uh, leads them to go in that dangerous direction and maybe make something else available that would be better than a drug and maybe people wouldn't be drawn to those drugs. I don't know. <clears throat> The method of supplying drugs to addicts so as to wipe out the black market for drugs, and then it would be harder for anyone who's not an addict to get her hands on some drug. That seems to work pretty well in countries that try it. <clears throat> so maybe a similar general approach could work with non-free software as a way of discouraging it from being a successful business. What did you learn from the attempt to cancel you? Well, I learned, first of all, <clears throat> it's not clearly a thing of the past. I wish it were. There are still people who uh, make it their business to try to stop me from getting invited to speak. And it's a slow process working back from that. However, I learned the ability to stay calm and not react by getting upset and instead think carefully about what I should do. I am much, much better at staying, in, at keeping my self-control when I respond to antagonistic attitudes. In fact, it was amusing. <clears throat> I got a hate phone call uh, about that time, and someone I didn't know said, you defended Epstein. I said, I didn't. And a couple of interchanges like that, and I brought it into a reasonable conversation. I felt pretty good about that. Uh, we went on for a while talking about various questions of right and wrong, and how I had tried to do the right thing in connection with them, and what I thought, you know, because I, I certainly do not approve of, of Epstein, and I appreciate that uh, his actions were, were quite hurtful, and I never said otherwise. So uh, she was able to understand me too. This question seems to be written in such a way I can't see it or maybe just a blank sheet of paper got in. How and in what capacity does Web3 movement influence free software initiatives? <clears throat> well, if you develop some free software, those are free software initiatives and uh, you're influencing each other. Basically, f nobody's in charge of free software in general because every person or group contributing is free. That's the whole idea. <clears throat> because of that, I don't know how I could <clears throat> answer more than that. <clears throat> but if you think it would be a good idea for the GNU Project or FSF to recommend to people, hey, please try to develop something to do this if you can. We can think about it and maybe do that. That might help out. More and more software is produced, it says, using AI. 
I don't know whether this refers to things I would call AI or things I would call bullshit generators. As these apps can be so easily created, they have become a commodity and copyright and licenses become irrelevant. I don't see that that's true, uh, but it, it's so vague I couldn't tell. How can people here donate to the cause of freedom? Well, freedom, the cause of freedom includes lots of political causes. There are many different freedoms, such as freedom of speech, freedom to have a fair trial, uh, <clears throat> that are tremendously important to all of us, uh, not particularly related to software directly. There is uh, freedom to have an abortion, which is not directly pertinent to me, but it's a very important cause. Uh, and there are so many others. Uh, I can't give you an answer to a question that broad. But if you're talking about computing freedom and software freedom, well, <clears throat> Most of these issues, there is nothing but the FSF that campaigns for. At least, that's the, the big visible organization, but there are also lots of local organizations that promote software freedom in the area where they act. And there are a lot of those, <clears throat> and you can join those. You can also donate to the Free Software Foundation. Please do, we need your support. You can also become an activist yourself. Uh, donating to the FSF, you can do through fsf.org. How do you see freedom of transaction in your terms? I'm sorry, I'm not sure what that means. I could imagine various possible meanings for it maybe write another question as a follow-on. What would you say to people who, who say th that think AI is sentient and equal to us? Well, the real AI systems that I've heard about operate in very narrow domains. They're clear, you know, a, a program that can look at an image of some cells and report whether it's cancerous, uh, at least as accurate as a human, accurately as a human pathologist, that can be very useful, but it's it no, in no way comparable to the mental breadth of a human mind, and no one would ever think it was. I suspect that you're, when you, the person who wrote this question was thinking of bullshit generators. And there, well, there's, there are a lot of things I can say to them. I saw a wonderful lecture by Professor Zittrain of Harvard showing just how little uh, bullshit generators actually understand of what they output. And I think it got the message across very clearly but I don't know whether he's published that. But I think that the first step is stop calling them AI. That's why I put so much emphasis on what we should call them. After all, what we call them doesn't change what they are. If you call it a bullshit generator or you call it AI, it will still be the same system. Whichever one it happens to be, it'll still be the same. Uh, that whichever system you're talking about, that is, it will still be the same thing whether you call it AI or bullshit generator. But what people expect from it will be different. The practice of calling these things intelligence and repeating this many times a day to people leads most people unthinkingly to assume that that's true. That's why it makes a difference which one we call them. That's why 
Uh, it's not enough to say, yeah, they call them AI, but it's not, that's not true, and then go on calling them AI. If we want to change the direction of this, this direction to the public of what to think, we have to be heard on this. Whenever people talk with us about these things and call it AI, we've got to be there to say, that's a misnomer. They are, they are not anything like what you think. I suspect GitHub is the tip of the iceberg. From here, freedom is perhaps too expensive as it will require whole stack change. I don't know what you mean by stack in this context, but <clears throat> uh, if you don't want to host on GitHub, there are better repository sites, more respecting of freedom, that are listed in that same page, gnu.org slash software slash repo criteria evaluations. Outside of tech, what do you like to do? What are your hobbies? Well, I used to have some hobbies, which basically I found it inevitably I would give up. I used to love international folk dancing, but an injury meant I couldn't do it anymore, or other kinds of dancing that I used to enjoy. Uh, I used to enjoy playing music on the recorder, but 10 years or so ago, I found that even when I practiced up, I couldn't play tunes and have them come out right that I, even the same tunes I, that I had loved and had learned to play, uh, I didn't, I don't know why that is, but I gave up. I still enjoy eating delicious food. It's not as easy as it was because I don't dare eat indoors with other people around. I could catch COVID that way and I could end up dead. So I can only eat with people in outdoor restaurants or at least outdoor tables and that limits what's available. Or if they can come to my house, I can turn on the HEPA filter I got for this purpose. Okay, sometimes one or the other will work. But it's a, a lot more constraining than it had been. Bullshit generators are objectively helping users with efficiency. Are they? How does the free software movement reconcile with this fact? Is it a fact? I don't know that it's helping them. Uh, what I hear is that it's often, often making users frustrated, but I have no personal, uh, personal experience of this. Uh, since you have to run non-free software and also it generally to talk to them and since they're running on someone else's server i wouldn't be willing to actually use them you know to actually use uh someone else's server to do computing for real use rather than just playing uh it's what we call service as a software substitute, and it's a way of doing your computing and losing freedom in it. So I won't do it. So I, I have no experience of my own with using those systems, but I read plenty from people who do, which cast doubt on whether they're really helping people in a useful way. I mean, if I, want, if I wanted to try to write something and make it sound like good English uh, without having to actually write it, it might save me some time, but I'd have to read it very carefully to make sure it hadn't made any mistakes. Semantic mistakes, that is. <clears throat> 